All right, welcome back. We're at the Los Angeles Times Festival of Books. I'm very pleased to be sitting right now with Rain Wilson, the actor, the author, man of many talents, soul pancake, which we'll talk about a little bit too. Juggler. Do you? A little bit? Yeah, a little bit. All right, maybe we'll, maybe sure. we'll do some of that. The book is called The Bassoon King, My Life in Art, Faith, and Idiocy. There's a little bit of all those things in here. Yeah. But we yeah. should probably start with the bassoon. Yes. Because you do play bassoon, but it's sort of a metaphoric element to, to this thing. The bassoon means something more than just a bassoon to you. I, uh, it is. It is my badge. It's my nerd. I say it in the book, I say it's my nerd crucifix. So it's my nerd badge of honor, really. I, I played the bassoon for six years, but at the same time, I was also on the chess team and uh, did Model United Nations. I was on the Pottery Club, um, Dungeons and Dragons, science fiction book collection, just all kinds of nerddom. And uh, I think it really informed who I am and who I was. I'm really grateful for those years. They were really rich, and it led me into kind of the upper echelon of nerddom, which is the drama nerd, drama geek. You were a nerd before nerd was kind of cool. There was zero cool associated <laughs> with it uh, back in the day. Zero. In the 1980s, it's, uh, it was John Hughes movies, you know? You That's got right. the crap kicked out of you That's right. if you were dorky. That's right. Uh, you, weren't, you weren't made a CEO or a rock star or given a podcast. Yeah, but you, you came from a really creative family, though, so somehow or another, the embrace of the nerd was part of you. I mean, there was, like, something that was all cool with that. That's what creative families do. Tell us a little bit about that upbringing for you and how it led to well, the next phase. There was a lot that was really messed up about my family. Uh, there were a lot of great things, too. Uh, my family were bohemian. They really loved the arts. Uh, they were members of the Baha'i faith. They were very open to different beliefs. Um, we had lots of books in our house. My dad was painting big pictures and murals and uh, writing science fiction books. It was a very creative petri dish to grow up in, and uh, I'm really grateful for that. Yeah, well, a lot of this book is truly, um, you know, flat-out sort of biography and memoir of your life. There's some really funny things, only it's not told like many of the memoirs that people will read. It's really funny, and in fact, there's a section in this book where you I mean you're ruthless with your own life, and, and I don't know if the bassoonists have rallied for you out there, if you found like <laughs> any of them coming out of the woodwork, but there's, you, you know, starting with your babyhood, I mean, you talk about, you know, your fat head and the largeness of you as a baby. That would fall under the idiocy category, <laughs> yeah. so I, you, want, you want me to read some of this? Yeah, I've, I've, I've made, you know, there's a section where you actually describe your baby body right here. I think it's worth yes. reading, for this sure. This is part of the idiocy of who I am. I say in chapter one, the, the, the name of the chapter is called, What Shall We Name Baby Fathead? And I say, I had the biggest, fattest head of any baby that was ever born into the human species. My head was, and remains, a combination of the head of the alien from Alien and a prize-winning albino cassava melon from the Iowa State Fair. Um... I feel truly sorry for my parents, Shay and Bob. I imagine them cradling my doughy giganticness in the <laughs> rain-soaked winter of 1966 on their houseboat in Seattle. I was one of those tots that you see and gasp under your breath in quizzical horror. I wasn't one of those babies that make it easy for viewers to hide their surprised revulsion. I'm sure no one knew what to say when they saw my white, bloated Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade head lolling about on my snowy, damp potato sack body. I was like some kind of larva. I was the color of grub worms that have never seen the sun. Picture an ashen manatee with a tiny human face. Now picture this creature ha screaming to have its diaper changed. You get the idea. <laughs> And it goes on from there. Come on, that just made it the best interview right there. I was laughing out loud. I think a uh, tiny ashen manatee with a tiny human face, or an ashen manatee with a tiny human face, is that maybe the <laughs> sentence I'm most proud of. It's very nice. That I've ever written. It's very, very nice. You know, you, you, there's a lot of silliness in here. There's no doubt about it. We do get some behind-the-scenes stuff from The Office, too, mm -hmm. and about Dwight Schrute. In fact, Dwight Schrute writes your foreword, which is really fun. And obviously, there's a lot of people that want that behind-the-scenes stuff in the office. But you also deal with some serious subjects, like your Baha'i faith, yeah. which is unusual and different. How did that influence you growing up? Well, there's a spiritual story at the heart of the Bassoon King. And that is, I grew up a member of the Baha'i faith. My parents were Baha'is. Um, 
I left it in my 20s, as a lot of people do with their religious faith. I turned my back on it. I didn't want anything to do with morality, um, with the idea of God looking down on me, the rebellion against my parents. I just wanted to be an artist, bohemian, living in New York City in the late 80s, early 90s. And uh, it was a big part of my adulthood was finding my faith again, turning and finding my faith, um, going on a quest, really, to find the truth. I thought that maybe I threw the baby out with the bathwater when I uh, jettisoned God and religion and faith. And as I found myself increasingly unhappy in adulthood, I thought, well, maybe faith and God, maybe the answer lies there. So I try and keep it light and, and humorous, as you can see, but uh, I do kind of explore some deeper themes, and that spiritual journey is one of them. Yeah, well, I mean, that's sort of spawned the idea of Soul Pancake, which is out there killing it right now. I mean, you've got, like, this media company that you created, and it started off as a YouTube channel. It's now creating videos for other companies yep. as well. Mm -hmm. And you've got the kid president who 38 million or 120, however many millions of people have yep. watched, and yep. you've done other things too. But what I loved about that, when you described Soul Pancake, it was something about, you know... To make some of those uh, words that had become icky over time, I think is the way you put it, yep. become more palatable. Yeah. What spawned that? Well, that was part of the discussion in, when we first started Soul Pancake. It was just a website before it was a YouTube channel and a media company. And we wanted to have people explore life's big questions. This was a big part of my journey, was exploring life's big questions. Why am I here? Why are we alive? What's my purpose? And I wanted to make a forum for young people to be able to dig into those questions as well. So um, the, some of the words that we tried to reinvent were like words like God. You know, what, is, what does that mean? So many people hear the word and they cringe, right? They think of a judgmental guy with a beard on a cloud looking down at them. They think of the God of their forefathers, the God of some particular church. So God, the word spirituality, means either means like a hippy-dippy, airy-fairy yoga class or else it's a kind of born-again fundamentalist religion. Um, we wanted to expand some of these words at Soul Pancake, and we don't do that work so much anymore. We make more um, entertaining, enlightening, um, inspiring content, but... Digging into those words and the meaning behind them has been a really important part of my life, and that's uh, a thread that runs through the book. Yeah, and I think a lot of people who were introduced to you as Dwight Schrute, who know The Office, nine seasons of that, I mean, we're really, you became part of the public consciousness of television viewers. Uh, this is an entirely other side of you that maybe people don't know about but it seems to be taking off. I mean, Oprah called and, want, and, you know, and, yep. and asked for you to do some stuff with her for her own network. So yep. when Oprah calls, you you got to sort of know that something's going right. Exactly. Soul Pancake. Exactly. Yeah, yeah it's, been, it's been interesting. It's been a strange thing. Like, what's this weird-looking comic character actor known for playing a, a paper salesman? Why is he talking to Oprah about spirituality? I think people didn't quite know how to process it. They all thought it was very strange. But... It's part of who I am, and that's what the book embraces. The bassoon came embraces that. I am a strange character. I'm a comedy character guy. I like playing oddballs and freaks. I was kind of an oddball and a freak growing up. And at the same time, I have a spiritual side. I have a soul. I have a heart. And Foundation in Haiti that you created. You know. Yeah, we do. My wife and I do a lot of work in Haiti. Um, I want to explore both those sides. They're both part of me, equally. Yeah. Well, you're still hilarious. I mean, one of the things, I mean, Dwight is a character. You've played many others. I love you in Almost Famous, uh, that sort of Hunter S. Thompson-esque character that yep. you play. I mm -hmm. mean, they never sort of identify you as such. But, I mean, there's so many characters you play that people know now. Um, and to have, though, that, that, that launch pad of The Office, I mean, we have to talk about that a little bit. I mean, there were so many times when people were talking about, is this show going to get canceled? Somehow it made it. You were literally the first person they hired, from what I understand, in the show. Mm -hmm. It kept making it, making it, making it through, and it became a family for you. Yeah, you know, I'm so grateful for The Office. Uh, I was starting to get a little well-known before The Office. I was on a show called Six Feet Under before The Office, but The Office was really the launching pad. But I go into detail in the book. You're right, the show was almost canceled 
five or six different times. It, it barely had hung on, just by a thread. And uh, those were some really exciting times in those early years of The Office, 2004, 2005, 2006. Um, and then all of a sudden, we were a hit, and the rest is history. And I'm really honored to be a part of such a great show with a great ensemble. I mean, <laughs> pretty exciting over there. <laughs> what does it say? Admired man. The, the making, making of an, an admired man. The making of an admired man. That's right. They should be listening to this interview. <laughs> One of the things uh, about that, though, is that you also pioneered, you're one of the first shows to pioneer the binge-watching concept. I mean, right when you guys were, like, moving into syndication, things were happening on, you know, on demand, and now so many people came to that show watching seasons at a time, literally over the course of a few weeks. Television transformed from when we started to when we ended. It was a completely different landscape in a very, very short eight or nine years. We were the first show that was a big bestseller on iTunes, where people all of a sudden, there was this new revenue stream. People were paying 99 cents to watch a show when they wanted to watch it, you know, on their little right. video iPads and iPods. Um, we were always number one on that because the young people liked that. And then there was another revenue stream for television when people were buying DVDs. And now it's on, stuff is on Netflix. So the idea of like, sitting down for an appointment television. I'm going to, Thursday at 9 o'clock, I'm going to watch this show. It doesn't really exist anymore so much. We were one of the last shows that did that, and then one of the first shows that crossed over into this kind of being uh, digested as new media. Yeah. So it's been, it's been interesting kind of learning about this yeah. and finding out. Well, it's been very it. cool. And I'm thrilled to have you here on our set. And you're making bassoon players everywhere cool again. Thank you. Uh, Good. And, and uh, it's great to have you. The book is really funny. Thanks. And uh, it's great to have Rain Wilson okay. with PBS. Thanks so was much for being here. Was this the best interview ever? Best interview ever. It was good, right? You felt it too. Oh, I felt the magic. <laughs> it's tingly.